to the teaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the Word of God without compromise. Raising up disciples who, through faith in God, will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. So get a hold of these things I'm going to give to you today. Just jot them down as a little list because these are things you're going to want to keep reminding yourself of and look to about what we do, basics of what we've taught. Now, I'm not giving you all the details on these. We've done that throughout this whole series. So what I'm doing now is I'm just pinpointing these key things that we've talked about of what it takes to walk in this blessing of what God has for our life of prosperity. We've been talking about this verse all through this series, but I haven't had you look at it. I wanted you to get eyes on it today. Proverbs 10, if you're there, shout amen. amen. No, 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 shout amen. amen. Verse 22, see, I know when I'm gone, these others kind of let you slack, but I'm not going to do that. And I don't, I, I don't encourage them to not do anything other than what they do. So they're not, they're not doing wrong, but I'm your pastor. I'm going to make sure you're awake, Jesus' name. Verse 22, the blessing of the Lord makes one what? Rich. The blessing of the Lord makes one poor. The blessing of the Lord makes one lack. The blessing of the Lord causes one to not have enough. Is that what it says? Is there anybody in the room in Proverbs 10, 22? The blessing of the Lord makes one what? No, tell me out loud. Okay, so the word rich here, a lot of people would say in relationship to what they would look at a religious mindset of this verse. Well, that's really not talking about financially, Pastor. This is talking about spiritually. No, the word here means wealthy. The word means here of having much substance. So this isn't talking about spiritually. This is talking about financially. This is talking about in wealth and in what you have by way of possession. So what does the blessing of the Lord do? It makes one rich. What do we want to do? Get under that blessing. We want to make sure we're walking under that blessing. If we're walking under the blessing of the Lord, guess what I have the ability to do? I have the ability to walk in wealth. It will make me wealthy. Notice the last part of the verse. And he, God's prosperity, adds no sorrow with it. Say, God adds no sorrow with it. Meaning what? God's prosperity doesn't come with fear and torment and worry. Because a lot of people literally could have, and they do, a lot of people in this world today have a lot of money, but yet they live fearful. They live in worry. They go to bed at night, can't hardly sleep. They're afraid to lose what they got. They're afraid of what obviously people are trying to do to take advantage of what they do have. On and on and on we could go. But the, the Lord's blessing of prosperity adds no sorrow with it. So guess what that means? I walk in peace. I walk in joy. I walk in liberty. And I want you to get this. And I don't trust in my riches. I don't trust in my riches. See, if you're trusting in riches, guess what that's going to do? Add sorrow with it. I want you to get that point. If I'm trusting in riches, how do I know I'm trusting in riches? Because it's going to add sorrow with it. Meaning what? You're going to have worry. You're still going to have some stress and you're still going to have some fear about financial issues and finances and having needs met, etc. But see, if you know the blessing of the Lord and you're walking in it, guess what you know? My God, as I do what Scripture teaches me, will make sure that His Word works in my life to provide for me exactly what He said, the wealth I need. Therefore, I never have to live a day on the planet with worry or fear or any form of stress or concern about finances. If you are, you've not learned to walk in the blessing of the Lord. I'm going to say that again. If any of that's going on in your life financially, you've not learned to walk in the blessing of the Lord because the blessing of the Lord adds no sorrow. There is no sorrow. All it means is if I learn to walk in the blessing of the Lord, walking in the light of trust in what He says, I'm to do to prosper, then guess what I know? I will in no way have any sorrow come along with that because I'll always know how to get more riches. I'll always know how to get more wealth. I'll never be afraid to give when God tells me to give. I'll never be afraid to sow when God tells me to sow. I won't be like the rich man that Jesus talked about who had so much riches that he built this big barn to store it all in. He got it full and then he decided to build more barns to add more. And he said, what are you doing? 
What are you doing? If your life ends tomorrow, who gets all those riches? What good was it for you to have them? Exactly. You know, there's nothing wrong with investments and there's nothing wrong with storing up for obviously times you have need. You should actually do that. Mom and I were talking about this the other day. I remember my grandpa, he had, I remember the original full silver dollars. All silver. Man, he had collected a bunch of those and saved them up for his grandkids. I don't know whatever happened to mine. I don't know. I never got them. I don't know what, I don't care, but I mean, I don't know what happened to them. But I remember seeing them in my grandma and grandpa's house, you know, and one day they were going to become ours. They had them split up for all the grandkids, but for some reason, uh, some of us never got ours, but neither here nor there. I'm not mad at anybody or upset about it. I'm just trying to explain something. There's a, there's a truth behind saving up that to a degree, but what good does it do if you just save it up for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation, and the next generation. What good are the riches doing? In truth, you know what that's doing in most people's lives? That's getting their trust in riches. Well, I got this set aside, so I don't have to worry because I got this set aside. No, you're going to worry because your trust is in the wrong thing. If your trust in riches, you're going to sorrow. I love what Dr. Summerall said. Dr. Summerall, I heard the actual message, the actual teaching. I'm watching him on video teaching this message. His actual, some of his kids are there in the room that traveled with him the latter part of his life in ministry. And he said, I'm telling you, Dr. Summerall knows why God gave Dr. Summerall money. And I don't have it stored up like millions and millions in the bank. But whenever I need it, guess what? I put my faith in God and it comes. God told me to buy a radio station. I had no money to buy a radio station. I went and signed my name, and when the time came to pay for the radio station, I had the money to pay for the radio station. See, that's called faith, because he knew what God told him to do. God told me to buy a TV station. I had no money to buy it, but I signed for it. I actually had the money when the time came. God told me to buy a ship, major ship, to start shipping food all around the world. It was actually from another country. I went and signed the contract. I had no money to buy it, but when that ship pulled into Harbor, I had every penny to pay for it. Because I had no sorrow about money because my trust wasn't in riches. I was just doing what God told me to do. And if God told me to do it, he's going to provide it. He's going to supply it, praise God. So there is no sorrow in those situations because guess what? I know in who my, my faith and my reliance is upon and the one who has the blessing on my life. His blessing makes me rich and there is no sorrow that comes with that. So there is some degree to the fact that a lot of people, they just keep storing up and they're going to pass it on, store up, pass it on, store it up, pass it on. What good's that ever going to do? What good's that ever going to do? So Sumrall told his kids in this meeting, he thought I forgot about it. Won't go leave him standing there at the altar. I'll finish the story. He told his kids in the meeting, he said, I want to just tell all of you, you already already know this, but I'll make it public. You're not getting a single penny that I have. Not a single penny. I want every bit of finances I have to preach the gospel. And before I pass away, God will alert me, before I pass away, what little bit I may have left in the bank is going to go back into the ministry to preach the gospel or is going to be willed to some ministry to preach the gospel. I'm not giving it to my kids. You're supposed to live up an inheritance for your kids. Wait a minute. You ought to define what that inheritance is. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with laying up a financial inheritance, but the truth is the inheritance talked about there is this relationship with God. You couldn't give your kids a better inheritance. If they know how to walk with God, they know how to get money the same way you learn how to get it. And guess what? He said, when I pass away, there'll be no money left in my bank accounts. There'll be no money for the banks to take and for everybody to argue and fight over and who gets it and who does it. No, it's going to preach the gospel. That's what it's here to do. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. And when you live like that, guess what you live without? Sorrow. You will live without sorrow because you know the blessing of the Lord does what? Makes you rich. Makes you rich. I want you to turn with me, if you would, please. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 4. Looking at my notes, kind of seeing. No, 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 no. Let's go to Psalms first. Go to Psalm 24. Go there real quick. Psalm 24. I'm going to give you some bonus verses this morning. Psalm 24. Let's go there first. Praise the Lord. Say, praise the Lord. So if I walk in the blessing of the Lord, what does it do? It will, it will help make me wealthy. Now, it's not going to happen without me doing something. Because we have to walk in the blessing of the Lord. There's something we have to do. But if we do what he says to get in that blessing, guess what he said? I'll make you rich. Add no sorrow with it. I'm going to go over with you again real quick what we've already covered in multiple series of this message, multiple parts of this message, last two parts actually. So I'm just, all I'm going to do right now is review. You're in Psalm 24. I'm going to review and give you some scriptures to go with it, what we've already touched on. What I'm giving you is the key things. I'm going to add a bonus one today. I gave you six the other night. I'm going to give you seven key things of what you do to walk in the blessing of the Lord. 
If you do these seven things, guess what? It'll make you rich. You'll see wealth come. Number one, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11 is the verse I gave you relating to this, although we showed you many verses about this. But I gave you 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. Number one, just write it down, tithes and offerings. If you are not going to walk in tithes and offerings, you are not going to walk in the blessing of the Lord. If you want the blessing of the Lord in your life, you're going to have to first of all start off with this spiritual law God placed in the earth. If you think I'm trying to get your money, you've already missed it. You've already missed it. God's trying to get you money. God's trying to get you blessed. We studied this in detail. When was the first time we saw the tithe show up in the context of the Bible? Abram. Abram had gone out, won a battle, got Lot back, got their families back, got not only all their money back, but even spoiled from the enemy. So they now had increase. The spoil from the enemy was increased, what they didn't have before. And he's on his way back, and on his way back, all of a sudden, this mysterious high priest called Melchizedek shows up. He's there for one reason. He's there to receive a tithe from Abram. Why? So he can speak God's blessing over his life. And if you don't get into tithes and offerings, if you're not going to tithe, if you're not going to take... The, now listen, you're not a tither if you wait to see if you got enough to pay the tithe. That's not a tither. That is not a tither. Tithe means this comes first. I don't wait to see if I've got enough to pay the tithe. If I'm a tither, I recognize who my source is. I recognize who my faith is in. My faith is in my God. My God put in this earth a law called seed time and harvest... And the Bible says in Genesis, as long as the earth remains, last I checked, it's still here. Long as the earth, last I checked, it's still here. Some of you act like it's not. You're sitting on it. Wake up. Last I checked, it's still here. Why did he put this law of seed time and harvest in the earth? Was it for him? It was for me and you. So part of what he provided is a way for us to do what? Get blessing in our life. To receive blessing in our life. And he said, as long as the earth remains, this, this law will be in operation. Seed time and harvest. So what God did before the law was ever established is he said, here's where you begin. You begin by taking the first tenth of what you have. You put it aside. You give it to me. That's mine. Yes. Leviticus 27, 30. The tithe is the Lord's. And you honor me with that. And if you honor me with that, aren't you glad? Hebrews 7 says, we now have yes. a high priest yes. according to the order right. of Melchizedek. Amen. And here mortal men receive the tithe. But there, this is New Testament. Yes. It is witnessed of who he lives, Jesus, that he receives it. Guess what he does? He does exactly what Melchizedek did. How many of you paid your tithe today? Raise your hand if you paid your tithe today. Guess what Jesus did when you did that? Guess what Jesus did when you brought it up here and worshiped him with it? Jesus is up in heaven speaking blessing back over you. Just like Melchizedek did with Abram. So realize I've got to be a tither, but if I want to get into in true increase, what do I need to do? I even need to give offerings. Because offerings is what he multiplies back to us. The tithe, he rebukes the devourer for our sake. He speaks his blessing over our life. But when we get into offerings, he now does what? Multiplies that. Why? Because that's ours. The tithe is his. He's not going to multiply back to you what's his. He's going to multiply what you gave of yours. And when you start giving offerings, and you can look at it as, well, I don't have much to give. Let me help you. God, don't look at it as an amount. Right? Come on, you're, you're pushing me too far into this. I don't want to preach this far into this first point. But you got to understand this. If I don't choose to live under the law of seed time and harvest, tithes and offerings, I'm not going to get the benefit of the blessing God has for my life. So that's up to you, church. We've proven it through teaching over and over again. Why do I always take a few minutes on Sunday morning to talk about it? So that people new coming in understand this is what God set up for us. To help us, to bless us. Could I get a better amen? Number two, the second key we talked about, I gave you two verses for this, Isaiah 119. These are what you're going to want to write down if you want to prosper. If you want to prosper, you better get these stowed away somewhere. You better review them consistently because I will promise you what you heard isn't going to bring faith. It's what you're hearing. And you need to keep reminding yourself of these things and speaking them over your life. So the second thing, Isaiah 119, and I gave you Psalm 128, 1 and 2. Isaiah 119 and Psalm 128, 1 and 2. Number two, say number two. Obedience, obedience say that, obedience. brings blessing. Number two, obedience brings blessing. I cannot walk in disobedience to what I know without a doubt is common sense stuff with God that I should not be doing. 
I mean, seriously, if I'm going to choose to try to go steal money from stores, rob from my boss, take things I shouldn't, you know, there's people who take stuff from work and say, well, they won't miss it. That's called thief. That's called, that's called stealing. That's called being a thief. If you're taking something they don't know where you're taking and they didn't say it's okay. I'm working at Muggs Baker and Cafe. Man, they make so many cookies there. I'm just going to sneak a couple aside in my little bag every day before I leave without their permission. They won't miss it. They make so many of them. If you don't have their permission, you're stealing. God's not going to bless you for that. I said, God's not going to bless you for that. Can I get a better amen? It doesn't matter what you see in relationship to what you think about life. It's simple. If I choose, Isaiah 119 is powerful. If you're willing and obedient, You'll eat the good of the land. So if I don't just walk out basic obedience. Now remember, this isn't, oh, I got to be perfect or God can't bless me. No, God couldn't bless any of us if we had to be perfect in all that we do. But it's simple, basic common sense. If I know things I shouldn't be doing, stop doing them. If I, wait a minute, if I know there's things I should do, start doing them. How many Christians know church is important yet still don't make it a priority? How many, know, how many know relationship with God is important, still don't make it a priority? They keep putting it off. You know the biggest killer of what God has for your life? You want to know the biggest killer of what God has for your life? Does anybody want to know the biggest killer of what God has for your life? Anybody here want to know what it is? It's one word. You ready? It's called procrastination. You procrastinate. You keep putting it off. You keep choosing to put it off. Well, one day I'm going to start spending time in the Word with God every day. One day, I'm going to start learning more about prayer. One day, I'm going to start getting more and study the Word. Well, see, you're never going to do it. Not with that attitude. One day. No, what you do is you say, today's the day. Today's the day. Today's the day. Can I get a better amen? Amen. So realize you and I have to understand that simple obedience to God's Word brings what? Blessing. Because what we're doing, I want to say it over and over. I've said it so many times as a church, as, uh, as a pastor of this church. We're not earning anything from God. We're learning. We're learning how to walk in what God already set up in this earth for us to be blessed by. And God can't change the system for you. See, God doesn't change. He's already set all these laws up. He's already set all this up for us to walk out what he has for our life. He can't turn around and change it for you because you want to live a different way. So obedience, say it again, brings blessing. Number three, Luke 5. I really like this story in Luke 5, 1 through 7. Luke 5, 1 through 7. This is where he uses Peter's boat to to actually preach the gospel. After they've been fishing all night, gets in the boat, has them push out a little way so all the multitude can hear him. And then he comes back to the shore and he tells Peter, let down the nets for a catch. Not the time you go fishing. They'd done that all night, didn't catch anything. But guess what? Peter heard from the Lord what he said, and he followed his instruction. And when he let down the net, guess what? They caught so many fish, they had to call another boat out. I call that multiplication. I call that blessing. I call that prosperity. Any idea how much money they made off all those catch of those fish? They made a lot of money. Fishermen weren't poor in those days. Number three, say number three. What do you got to do? Hear from the Lord and follow his instructions. You got to hear from the Lord and follow his instructions. Now, if you're going to get lazy, don't want to write these things down. Don't get mad at me. If you're not, if you're lacking, you come, pastor. I just don't know why I can't get my knees met. Wait a minute. Were you in church when we preached these messages? Yeah. Why didn't you write it down? Why didn't you apply it? See, you coming to me now to try to get you to figure out what's wrong isn't going to help you fix the problem. I'm telling you what will fix the problem right now. So you have to do what? Hear from God and follow his instruction. What does that mean about your life? Again, we've mentioned this in multiple details about what we've talked about when we touched on this point. I got to know I'm in the job God wants me in. What if I'm not in the job God wants me in? He can't prosper me to the degree he wants to. Right? I got to hear from God. What does he want me to do? Does he want me to be a fisherman? Does he want me to be a tax collector? I don't know. Does he, whatever he, does he want me to be a carpenter? What does God want me to do? You got to know that God has a plan for your life. Yes, he does. And you got to learn what that is and walk that out and follow his instruction. What if I'm in my plan, but it's still not working real good? You need to start talking to God. Lord, show me it where I'm missing it. Show me what I need to do different. Show me what I need to correct or fix. Maybe I'm in the job I'm in to be in. Maybe I'm doing the business I'm supposed to do, but I'm somehow not seeing it working, so there must be something needs to be corrected. Well, when you hear God's instruction, go let down the net for a catch. Guess what? You're about to bring in a haul, baby. 
you're about to have to call some helpers to come help you haul it all in. The problem is we don't take time to hear from him. Come on. It's like Charlie told you when I was gone. We wait till after all hell breaks loose and then we go to God. Why don't you go to him first? Why don't you start seeking him more every day? Because if you'll start seeking him, guess what? God's a proactive God. If you'll seek God every day, he'll already start preparing you for your tomorrows. You won't have to wait till tomorrow's problems come to now find out what do I do. If you'll hear God today, he's already setting you up for blessing for your tomorrow. He's going to help you avoid a lot of problems. And he already knows problems that will come, but he already knows how to direct you around them or how to help you through them. Could I get a better amen? You got to hear from the Lord. And once you do, what do you got to do? Do what he says. Now, remember, if you're going to hear from the Lord and do what he says, this is not going to go contrary to the word. You cannot just claim, well, I heard God. I said this the other night. I'm going to say it again. I can't even tell you. I can't even begin to tell you in 30 plus years of pastor how many people I've had in this church over those years come and say, well, God told me this or God told me that. And I said, how could God have told you that? Well, he did. How could he? What do you mean? I said, let me show you umpteen verses that go contrary to what you just said God said. And this verse proves that can't be true. And this verse, God doesn't speak contrary to his word. God always speaks in line with his words. So how could that be God? Well, I know it was God. And away they go. You're not going to get blessed because you're not following true instructions from God. Say, I must hear and follow his instructions. Now, the number one way to do that, ladies and gentlemen, develop your relationship with God every day. And don't come to him. I got to emphasize this again. Don't come to him because you're trying to get rich. Don't come to him because you're trying to get blessed. Come to him because you want to know him. Could I get a better amen? Amen. And that leads us to number four, which is a key principle to follow what I just said of number three. The verses I gave you here is 2 Chronicles 26, 2 Chronicles 26, 1 through 8. A 16-year-old king raised up by God in the days of the time of uh, Israel and that time over the, uh, over the uh, Ju- uh, tribe of Judah at 16 years old. But guess what the Bible says in those verses in 2 Chronicles 26, 1 through 8. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Yes, he did. Now here's a key. Number four, I want you to write it down this way. If you will seek the Lord, he will help you prosper. If you will seek the Lord, he will help you prosper. Isn't it the same as that as hearing him and follows him instructions? No. Hearing him is learning directly what he wants you to do. What does this mean, seeking the Lord? It's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. You go learn about that young king. It says twice that he was seeking his God and seeking the Lord. He wasn't seeking instruction. He wasn't seeking direction. You know what he was seeking? Relationship. And if you seek relationship with God, you'll have no problem with number three. You'll be able to hear him and receive his instructions. But you still got to hear him and do what? Follow his instructions. But to do that, number four, what do I got to do? I got to seek him. I got to seek him. So I wanted to add a bonus verse because you're so great to be here today. I wanted to bless you with a bonus verse and I knew you'd be excited about it. So I'm going to read them to you. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is what? Tell me out loud, please. Who is in Psalm 24, 1 besides Kathy and uh, Claire? Anybody else? Are you reading with me? Come on, church. The earth is the Lord's, Lord's and the all, and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Three, who may ascend in the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place, come before his presence? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Watch this, watch this. Five, he shall receive blessing from the Lord. What will he receive? Blessing. For, and the blessing of the Lord makes one rich. And has no sorrow with it. This person will receive what? Blessing from the Lord. And righteousness from the God of his salvation. Six, this is Jacob. The generation of those who what? Seek, underline it, him. Underline it, who seek your face. Who seek your face. And everything that he talked about, I want you to grab a hold of verse six. Because the people he's talking about is wrapped up and described in verse six. They are like Jacob, the very father of all the tribes of Israel. Who are seeking what? God. They're seeking his face. They're not seeking his hands. If you're coming to the Lord to see what he can do for you, you're coming for the wrong motive. 
There's nothing wrong with coming to God when you have need of help and ask God to help you to know what to do. There's nothing wrong with that. But my primary purpose is what I'm saying. My primary motive of why I seek God. Think of it this way, okay? If the only reason your kids ever come to you as a parent is because they want something. They, want, they don't really want you. They don't, re, they don't want a relationship with you. They just want what you can do for them and what you can give them. And that's the only time they come to you. They don't come to you just to get wrapped up in your arms and be with you and that you love on them because they like spending time with you. If all they ever did is just show up to get something from you, how would that make you feel as a parent? I think there's three in the room. How, how would that make you feel as a parent? Not very good. How do you think it makes the father feel? If the whole purpose of why we come to the father is to just seek his hands, what, can you, what he can do for us, there's no relationship in that. What was the purpose of why Jesus died to bring us back to the Father? So this is so critical. This fourth point is so critical. If you seek the Lord, guess what he'll do? He'll help you to prosper. And to do that, we got to be like this Jacob generation who seek what? His face. Face. That's relationship, folks. I said that's relationship. Can I get a better amen? Go back to 2 Corinthians 4 where we left off on Wednesday. We now are caught up. Although I wanted to add some bonus material there. 2 Corinthians 4. Hope you're getting these things down. 2 Corinthians 4. Praise God. Praise God. You ought to go back and get this message after it's posted. Listen to it over and over and over again. 2 Corinthians 4.13 is our fifth point. Key verse. We're going to look at another one. 2 Corinthians 4.13. Number five. Write this down. Believe and speak. Believe and speak, and then put a dash behind that, put down active faith. Believe and speak. speak. You can say it this way, have active faith. What do you do? What do you got to do to have active faith? Believe and speak. It doesn't matter what God has said in his word, he's got available to you. How are you going to get it? By faith. By faith, by trusting in him. So if I don't believe what God says about prosperity for my life, See, if I still allow my old mindset of any quote-unquote religious teaching or wrong indoctrination I got through the world, that I'm never to have anything, probably will never have anything, probably won't amount to much, let me help you. That's going to destroy your ability for God to bless you. You got to believe what God says about you. You got to believe what God says he has for you. You got to believe and do what? Speak it. You got to do what? Believe and speak it. Why? That's what faith does. If you don't have active faith in the area of prosperity, how are you going to prosper? Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, since we have the same spirit of faith. We weren't given a different type of faith than what Jesus had. We weren't given a different type of faith than what Kenneth Hagin had. Or Lester Summerall. Or John G. Lake. Or Smith Wigglesworth. Or anybody that we talk about that were great men and women of faith. We've all been given the same faith that God has. Since we've been given the same spirit of faith according to what is written about faith, what does faith do? I believed and therefore spoke. What are we supposed to do with this faith we're being given? Then we also do what? Believe and therefore speak. See, your faith is not active if you don't really believe it in your heart and speak it with your mouth. If you don't believe God wants you to prosper, go to Hebrews 4 while I'm talking. If you don't believe God really wants you to prosper, how are you going to prosper? How are you going to prosper? How are you going to walk in something you don't believe God really wants you to walk in? How are you going to walk in something you don't believe God really has for you? If you don't really believe God wants you prosperous, you're not going to walk in it because you're not even believing for it. But you got to do more than just believe for it, folks. You got to speak it. You got to declare what the Bible says. Remember what we read in the Psalms of the night? What did he say that we're supposed to do? We're supposed to say, let the Lord be magnified. Who takes delight in the prosperity of me, his servant? He takes delight in me, me, his servant, prospering. You got to declare that. said, you're supposed to continually say. Why? Because that's how faith works. Faith doesn't say at one time in relationship to what God says you are. When you believe for a promise, you accept it as done. But saying who you are should be something you do every day. You don't say at one time, well, God delights in me being prosperous. I said it once. It'll happen. No, it won't. Faith comes by hearing by the word of God. Faith believes and faith what? Speaks. So watch this. Book of Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Praise God. Future future, uh, name of our uh, coffee shop. Hebrews. Glory to God. 
Hebrews 4.1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel, say good news. What, what's part of that good news? He wants me prosperous. Notice the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard didn't profit them. Oh, wow. They heard it, but it didn't profit them. There was no advantage to it. I mean, Christians hear the word, but it doesn't profit them. Why did it not profit them? Watch, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. When you hear God's word, what do you got to do? Mix it with faith. What does faith do? Faith believes in faith. Speaks, what if I don't believe it yet? You start speaking it because you know God said it. Here's a simple way to know that I can believe in what I know I'm saying from God is true. Even if I don't really have it solidified in my heart yet, that it's already so. Here's how I can say this. Watch this. How can I know I can already say from my heart that I believe God's word over something and therefore speak it if I truly don't have the faith for it yet, Pastor, like I should? Let me ask a question. How many in this room believe that God lies? Raise your hand if you believe God lies. How many in this room believe everything God said is the truth? Raise your hand if you believe God said. So you already believe. You just said, I believe what God has said is the truth. It may not be solidified in your heart yet, but you already believe in your heart what he said is the truth. Start speaking it. You believe what he said is the truth. Start speaking it. Because you got to do what? Get faith active. Faith believes and faith speaks. So if you hear the word, but you don't mix it with faith. So how do we mix it with faith, Pastor? Drop down to verse 14. Watch this, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a high priest, great high priest, Jesus, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, underline it. Let us hold fast our confession. Say it. Let us hold fast our confession. Say it again. Let us hold fast our confession. I don't have time to read through all these verses. The words living, powerful, sharp, and to his sword. I don't have time to go through all these verses. What he just said was, if you want to walk in what God has a promise for you of, prosperity, how many want to do that? Yes. If you want to do that, what do you got to do? Get active faith. active faith. What's active faith? I got to take what I'm hearing through this message I'm hearing right now preached. Right. Yep. Right. And I got to do what? I got to take this message that I've heard and I got to mix faith with it. That's right. How do I mix faith with it? Right here. Your little tongue's your mixer. You start declaring what that word says. And when you start declaring what that word says, you're now mixing faith with what you heard. And as you're mixing faith with what you heard, guess what happens? Active faith starts going into operation. Things start changing. Things start changing. I said things start changing. But no active faith, no prosperity. If you don't have active faith in what God says is yours and what you can walk in, not going to work. The same as if I don't truly believe that healing's for me. See, even when you relate the context of healing to people, what is it that, that Kenneth Hagin learned was the most successful way when the gifts of, of healing weren't in manifestation to get people healed? What was it John G. Lake learned? What was it that Lydian B. Yeomans learned? What was it that these great ministers of the gospel learned would cause people to get healing into their bodies? Well, the Bible says clearly that in Jesus' day, they came to hear... And be healed. Amen. What do they come to do first of all? Hear to, hear to be what? Healed. Right. So they didn't come to be healed. They came to hear first. Yeah. And then to be healed. Because as they heard, faith rose in their heart. Right. And now they could be healed. Yeah. And for people that struggle still with healing, I'm going to tell you why. Because their faith is not active in that area. Right. Amen. It's a great little nugget. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. But if healing's not manifest, one of the reasons could be, could not be the only reason. But one of the primary reasons is because faith's not active in that area. How many have ever heard healings for you today? Yes. Let me see your hand if you've heard healings for you today. How many believe that? Yes. But how many of you say it on a regular basis? Yes. See, if you're not saying it, your faith's not active. Right. Come on. Yes. 2 Corinthians 4.13. Yes. Come on, shake your neighbor. Say, you need to wake up. Yes. What does faith do? It believes and it speaks. It believes and it it don't just believe, folks. It believes and it speaks. Why did they not have the faith, the majority? Come on, he's talking about the majority of the children of Israel who could have gone in the promised land, but only two did. Only Joshua and Caleb out of millions. Think of that. The majority are rarely right. The majority are rarely right. 
The minority, two of them. Joshua and Caleb entered into the promised land. Why did the rest not enter in? They didn't mix what they heard with faith. When the spies came back, 10 said, can't do it. Giants in the land, not possible. No way. There's no way we can do it. But Joshua and Caleb, what did they say? What God had said. What did they say? We're well, we're well able. We're well more than able. Our God has delivered them into our hand. Praise God. This land belongs. To, what were they doing? I'll tell you what they'd been doing up before that day. I'll tell you what they'd been doing before that day came. They'd been speaking that before they ever got there. You got to mix faith with, excuse me, you got to mix the word with faith. You got to mix what you hear with what? Faith. So they heard what God said. Guess what Joshua and Caleb were doing all the way over to the promised land? They were mixing faith with it. Guess what the others were not doing? They were not mixing faith with it. How do we know? They're groaning. They're complaining. They're mumbling. They're grumbling. I know that's none of you. You got to have active faith if you want to prosper. Philippians 4. Glory to God. Philippians 4. So number 5 again, you got to believe and speak. You got to do what? Got to have active faith. If you don't have active, a believer is supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. Supposed to live, the just shall live by faith. How do we live by faith? Come on, church. How do we live by faith? How is it we walk by faith? Faith believes and... So we're constantly saying over our life what God says. We're constantly declaring what God says. Or you can be like the children of Israel that didn't enter the promised land and just forget, be lazy and not care about it and say, no, I got a problem. I don't know how to do this. I'm going to be able to fix that. Don't know how we're going to pay that bill. Don't know how we're going to overcome that mountain. Don't know that situation. Let me help you. You ain't walking into the promise of God. You got to be saying what God says. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? Let me tell you who you want to walk with. God. You can't do that if you don't agree with him. God's not going to agree with you to talk negative. God's not going to come into your negative situation. Oh, I know I feel so bad for you. It's so horrible. Isn't it bad? Oh, it looks bad. I know you might not make it through this one. I just don't know what we're going to do. God doesn't do that. I said, God doesn't do that. Why would we? Philippians 4, preaching better than your amen in this morning. Come on, verse 15, Philippians 4, verse 15. Now, you Philippians, Paul said, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when he began to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, talking about his ministry, in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. What's, what do you mean? You're the only ones that supported me time and again. Realize in Paul's day, they couldn't jump online on the internet and go to a digital site and send him some money. They had to find him. They had to get to him. These people were so desiring to help Paul preach the gospel, they would give money to somebody that they would entrust it to and say, go find him. Imagine doing this, having to go find this guy. Where is he at? Going from town to town. Where's Paul now? Oh, you just missed him, man. He just left here. He's headed over there. And you have to go find him to get that money to him. He said, you are the only ones, you're the only church who shared with me, who gave time and again concerning giving and receiving so to my ministry. Watch this, 16, for even in Thessalonica, so they found him at one point in Thessalonica. <clears throat> Notice this, you sent aid, somebody had to bring it. You sent aid once and again for my necessities. One of many people would say, wow, our church isn't here, wonder where it went. We better go find pastors so we can get money to him to preach the gospel. Where's he at today? But this is what they did with Paul. Paul wasn't there. They're going to find him. Here's what I want you to see. Verse 17. Watch this. Not that I seek the gift. I'm not after your, your seed that you're sowing. Watch this. I seek the fruit. What's he seeking? I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Now that fruit is not provision for them. That fruit is not provision for them. That fruit is not bringing money back to them. Are you listening? Yes. That fruit is not bringing money back to them. What's that fruit? That fruit is the lives that are going to be touched and changed. Right. Amen. That fruit is the souls that are going to be born again and saved. Amen. Yes. Right. Amen. Are you listening? Yes. What, what was Paul's reasoning? 
for them to for him to receive that gift for them to receive as they sowed for him to receive that gift. I'm not trying to get money from you. I'm trying to get people. What was Paul's whole life? I'm trying to get people in the kingdom. It takes money to do that. So I'm not seeking your gift. That's not what I'm after. What I'm after is the fruit that will come because of it. That's why I'm asking you to give. That's why I'm asking you to sow. Because I want to go after that fruit. I want to go after those souls. I want to go after those that will be born again. So I'm not seeking the gift. I'm seeking the fruit that will what? Abound to what? Your account. That is held into your record in heaven. Any idea how much you've sown in the kingdom that every time you did, God has a record? <laughs> God has a record of every life that it touched and changed. He has a record. God's a good record keeper. Our government's about to get better. <laughs> They're about to be dealt with. But I'm here to tell you, God's a good accountant. God's book's always balanced. And you know what he does when he sees you give and when he sees those people coming to the kingdom off of what you gave? I credit that to Kathy Baker, to Wes Ward, to Bill Bartram, everybody who gave in that, 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 that time of ministry, to Don Dockery, name it, Matt Hyber, whoever was. If you gave in that service, whatever lives were touched and changed, God says that goes to your account. Yeah, but our pastor was preaching the gospel. doesn't matter. It goes to your account. It goes to your account because you enabled him to do it. Then he goes on to say, verse 18, Indeed, I have all, and I abound. I am full, having received from Ephroditus. Who's going to name your next kid Ephroditus? Sorry, Effie. Doesn't sound like it's a real positive look, outlook for you. Having received from Ephroditus the things, notice, the things sent from you, a sweet, watch this, sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So I want you to notice in this verse and the next one, this is in response. Say response. This is Paul responding to them doing what? Giving to help him preach the gospel. And he says, verse 19, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Why would God supply all their need? Back to point number one of prosperity, because they are functioning in the law of tithes and offerings. And when you function in the law of tithes and offerings, and you do so biblically, God goes to work. And God sees to it that that is multiplied back to you. Any good amens on that? Here's my point though, you ready? Again, point number five, excuse me, point, oh, I haven't got to yet. Let me give it to you. Point six. So what was the key here? Verse 17. I don't seek the gift, but I'm seeking what? What is it all about? The fruit. fruit. What's it all about, folks? Born again people. Spirits made new. Spirits born again. Number six. I want you to write this down. This is a key to God's plan for prosperity for your life. You ready? Our purpose is to seek and save the lost. Just like we talked about this morning. Luke 19.10. Our purpose, write it down, my purpose, say it, is to seek and save the lost. That's point number six. If you want to prosper and your purpose of living today is not to seek and save the lost, you're not going to prosper the way God wants you to because he wants fruit to abound to your account. The reason part of why he primarily wants to bless you and the way he wants to bless you is because then you'll have money to sow and to give to reap more souls. Well, who's going to take care of me? God will. 2 Corinthians 9 says, clearly, if you go back to the tithes and offering thing, what did God say? God says, in giving, you will have bread for food, all that you need for you and your family. Come on. Bread for food, seed to sow, and I'll multiply that seed. And you'll have what? More than enough. More than enough. So realize this, very critical. This is point number six. I have to remind, remind myself my purpose for prospering. Prospering. What is the primary purpose for me prospering? To seek and save the lost. That I can sow to the gospel. That I can help get the gospel out. Because without sowing that seed to Paul's life, the fruit would not have abounded. Could I get a better amen? When we lose sight of our primary purpose of prospering, if it's all about me having a bigger car, a bigger home, more stuff, more clothes, listen, all that will come. The Bible's clear. If you make the kingdom your priority, <laughs> under the dominion of the king, and walking that's right, what's right in his sight, these very things, all those things will be added unto you. 
I don't have to seek those things. What do I get to do? Seek reaching the lost. Could I get a better amen? Proverbs 10, because you came out on a Sunday morning and your pastor's home, I'm going to give you a bonus. This should be a given, but the more I thought about it this week, I thought, you know what? I better put it in there. People should automatically know this, but I'm going to put it in there anyway. Should be a given, but in today's society, not talking about you, but just people in general, maybe we better add this to the list because it's all through Scripture. If we want to prosper, stick to these seven things, and I will tell you what, you're going to see God do exactly what He promised. Well, that's a lot to do. Not if you really start looking it over good. It's really not. And honestly, it's nothing more than us committing our hearts to walk in the light of what we know we're supposed to walk in as a child of God. But we have to understand that this stuff just doesn't, as, as Brother Hagin used to say, this prosperity doesn't just fall on us like ripe apples off a tree. We have a part to play. Everything's been put here for us to prosper. I'm going to remind you, before I read my verse and close out this morning, I'm going to remind you about Deuteronomy 8.18. What did God say in Deuteronomy 8.18? I've given you the ability to get wealth. Where's the wealth? It's here. And I've given you the ability. Well, how do I get that ability? Apply these seven things to your life and you'll walk in your ability to get wealth. I guarantee it. I guarantee. Remember that guy from Louisiana? I guarantee. I guarantee it, church. Because it's all through the scriptures. Could I get any good amens on that? Proverbs 10 verse 4. Proverbs 10, verse 4, he who has a slack hand, say lazy, he who has a slack hand becomes what? Uh-oh. Say lazy. So what's a slack hand? Lazy. You're not willing to work. You're not willing to take advantage of what God's enabled you with, gifted you with, given you ability to do. He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent, come on, the hand of the diligent, not lazy, say not lazy. Makes what? Makes rich. See, this isn't a proposition from God. Sit back, do nothing. Just, you know, feast on YouTube and, 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 and TV and social media and, and just sit there and do not Be lazy. Sit around your PJs, you know, like they taught you during COVID. And now all of a sudden you're wearing them to the store for some reason. Oh, man, I tell you, the worst thing for me about COVID is seeing people walking around PJs in the store. How about you? But I never saw that before COVID. But after COVID, it's like, now these people, oh, hey, we wear them at home. Wait, 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 wait. What are pajamas for? The last I actually knew about pajamas is there for when you go night-night. Like when you go Betty Bye, you put your little PJs on. Not when you go shopping at the store. Come on, somebody. You might want to clothe yourself a little bit. Man, can you, these people, PJs, and I mean, what, they'd walk barefoot in the store. Most of them probably would if they could. The, the barest thing they can put on their, on their feet, you know. I mean, my goodness, uh, don't, don't misunderstand me. But seriously, man, some of these people, man, it looks like you hadn't put a comb to your hair in like two weeks. Serious. Their hair's everywhere, you know, and I mean, goodness, they walk by, it's like, whoa, do you know about deodorant? Do you realize you are supposed to try to use a little bit of that every day? Maybe wash some of the stink off you, you know, if you've been working or whatever. I'm not trying to make fun. I'm just saying, you can't live a lazy life. I, I do this. I, I tell you what, I, I, I do this every time I go to the grocery store, every time I go to, to any store where there's, a, where there's, you know, carts, you know, that you have to push stuff out to your car. It never fails. I go to my car, and as I get to my vehicle, and any of my family can tell you, when we're done putting stuff up, guess where the cart goes? There's a cart return for those things. Now, how about you? I worked I, as a kid growing up when I first, right before I graduated school and for a little while after graduating school, I first worked at a grocery store. I was a bagger. I was a good bagger, man. Pre-plastic bag days. Woo-hoo! I'd hate plastic bag bagging today. Man, you pop, you learn how to pop them babies one shot, boy. You, with one hand, Woo! Set that baby down, and here come them groceries. We would do our best to actually outrun the, 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 you know, we would challenge the checker, you know. I'll bet you can't get stuff back here without me getting in the bag. Me and a buddy of mine both had a job doing this, and we'd have challenges. We'd see two people coming up. All right, here we go, buddy. You ready? You ready? Yep, I'm going to beat you, man. Here we go. Who can get the, and then a lot of times you take them out even to their, you know, to their car. But you know what we did after we took the bags out to their car? We didn't leave the cart next to the car. 
We didn't leave the cart in the center of the, of the area. We, didn't, we brought it back into the store. Yeah. And when I actually go shopping, I return it to the cart return because the guys that work in the store have to bring those carts back in for you. And when you make it harder for them, you make it harder for you. And they're having to chase all those things down. Not to mention how many dents you put in my car. Because while I was in the store, you chose to get lazy, park next to me, leave your cart next to my vehicle. And it bumped into my car. I walk by these carts that are never in the cart deal. And every, I'm sorry, but I just, it just comes out of me, man. I walk by, you'll never mount anything. Unless you change, you'll never mount it. You're lazy. You're, you're lazy. You can't even return a cart to a cart return. And somehow you're going to walk in great blessing and prosperity. Let me help you, ladies and gentlemen. That ain't called diligence. You can't even return a simple cart to a cart return area and you think God's going to prosper you? That probably tells me how diligent you are with your work. You know, there are those people who have to, you know, like, like punch the clock. They're watching that clock, man. They cannot wait till that baby hits five if they get off at five, you know. And usually a few minutes before, they're already headed, you know, towards the door. That's not the diligent. You know, I, I got to give credit where credit's due. My dad taught me because my dad was a worker, man. He said, boy, wherever you go to work, you show up 10 minutes early, minimum 10 to 15 minutes early, you work 10 to 15 minutes late. I don't care they only pay you from 9 to 5 or whatever it is. You show up early, you stay late. You work harder than anybody, son, and you'll never have a problem finding work. And I never did. Every job I ever had, because I lived out the principles my dad taught me, I got, rated, I got lifted up in promotions and never asked for them. I got given positions I never asked for. Because when you find somebody that's really wanting to work and obviously help benefit your, your, your business or whatever you do, if they're really smart, guess what they're going to do? They're going to take care of you, man, because they know you're helping them. So guess what they're going to do if they're a good boss? They're going to help you. I'm going to read it one more time. Verse 4, he who has a slack hand becomes what? Poor. But the hand of the diligent makes one what? Rich. Number 7, you ready? This is not hard to figure out. Diligence will bring blessing. Diligence will bring blessing. You talk about anybody who ever inter gets interviewed, the Elon Musks, come on, man, the, the, the President Trumps. You know how hard these people work? Man, they work hard. I mean, these people are diligent. They're driven, man. They are just literally driven in whatever they do. Now, I think as a believer, there's a balance in this because clearly we have a walk with God to walk out. We have family to walk with. We have things in this life, whatever the other responsibilities were to do. But I'm just telling you right now, you're not going to walk in great blessing if you're just going to be really, you know, a total lazy, you know, sluggard and not put effort into what you're doing. You know, if you're in a business where you got opportunity to improve and get better, you're going to have to invest some time and effort to do so. That's right. If you don't, how are you going to actually increase in that position? That's right. Amen. You still with me? Yes. Now, I like this. I want to give you the definition of diligence in closing this morning. This is powerful. So diligent brings blessing. Say that. Here's the definition of diligent. You ready? I love this. Steady in application. Steady in application. Attentive, not negligent. Now that'll really help you more than just understanding the word lazy. Diligent means I'm steady in application. I'm attentive. I'm not negligent. If I'm steady in application, I'm consistent. I'm consistent at what I do. I don't show up and work hard one day and don't work hard the next. If I'm diligent, I'm attentive. Meaning what? I'm attentive to details. I'm attentive to what they've asked me to do. I'm attentive to the things I'm supposed to do. If my boss is directing me into doing something a certain way, I'm attentive to that. I don't change it. I don't come up with my own plan. If I've got something that I think might work better, there's nothing wrong with going to your boss and say, hey, i got an idea. just wanted to present it to you. But you're the boss. You just tell me. I'll do whatever you want. But also it means not to be negligent. You don't neglect. You don't neglect what you're supposed to do. You don't neglect what you're supposed to be doing in relationship to the business you have, the work you have, or relationship with God. If you neglect your relationship with God, you're not going to prosper. That's right. If you neglect what you're supposed to do at your job, you're not going to prosper. Right. You may not even have the job very long. Right. Now today, there's a lot of people. Anybody notice this? Again, this is, this is what the devil did post-COVID. Right. It's what the devil did in prepping the earth for the Antichrist. Post-COVID, what the, what the devil did is he literally conditioned many, many people to say, we don't need to work, the government will pay for us. Where do you think that money comes from? 
comes from people who work. This is called socialism. It doesn't work. Look at every socialist society that's ever tried to make it work. It don't work. It causes bread lines. It causes poverty. It causes lack. Because if all of a sudden I'm working and you're taking all our money and you're not working, guess what that's going to make me do? Why should I work? If they, don't, if they don't work and they get all this money, why should I work to give them more money? So diligent means I don't neglect my responsibility. I don't neglect my responsibility on the job that I have. You know, I had, because the way I was raised by my dad, and honestly, as I got older, it got worse and worse. But as I got older, you know, there were, how many know this? You can work somewhere where other people don't do their job. And you know what that makes you want to do? Why should I do mine? They get paid the same amount I do, and they're not working as hard as I am. Why should I work so hard? Because you're not working for the lazy employee. That's right. You're working for the employer. And the Bible says whatever you do, you're supposed to do is unto the Lord, not to man. So if you're negligent and you don't do what you're supposed to do because of what somebody else did, you're not going to prosper. You're not going to be blessed. You're not going to get promoted. You're not going to actually get put in a position of promotion. And see, this is something that a lot of people fall for. Well, there's no reason for me to work so hard because they're not. And guess what? The people that don't work hard, guess what then they do on top of that? Guess what the enemy does with their little mouth? Talking to you. They put you down because you're working so hard. What are you working so hard for? I had one guy at one place say, man, you're trying to make us all look bad. No, you already look bad. (laughs) You'd have to try. I have to drive, man. I can tell you right now, you don't see it, but you really look bad. You some lazy people, man. I don't know how these people even keep you other than they can't find somebody else to take your job. But I got a word for you. If somebody comes along that will take your job that'll do it, watch, you're gone. You're gone, man. I had one guy get so mad at me, had a job, and this is just the way I was raised. And this is why God has helped bless my life because I've learned you don't become somebody who is a sluggard or lazy. You become diligent and you don't neglect what you're supposed to do and you get consistent at what you do and God will promote you for it. God will bless you for it. You're not going to do that if you're not what? Diligent. Diligent means I what? I'm steady in my application. I'm attentive to my job and what I'm to do. And I don't neglect what I'm supposed to do. And if I do that, I'm going to prosper. And I'm out of time. pray that you are blessed by the message Pastor Baker shared with you today. For more spiritual resources that can help you in your walk with God, or to invite Pastor Baker as a guest speaker, just go to our website at cffchurch.com. You will find additional teachings by video, audio, and printed resources that will be a blessing to you. May God's very best be yours.